Rajesh Rahman is the chief architect for Signal FX. What does that mean? Well, in this episode, Rajesh and Ian dive into his role and how he focuses on not just the implementation of systems and processes at Signal FX, but also the best strategies and practices that will be needed months down the line. They also go into Rajesh's history at Google and Facebook and discuss cloud technology and the future of the industry. This podcast is sponsored by the Lightning Platform by Salesforce. Salesforce just introduced the Lightning Platform Mobile, the low-code mobile app development platform that empowers anyone to easily build, publish, and manage AI-powered mobile apps for employees and for customers. Find out more at salesforce.com slash build mobile apps. Welcome to another episode of IT Visionaries. I'm Ian Faison, Chief Content Officer here at mission.org and in studio. Rajesh, what's going on? Not very much. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me on the program. Yeah, we are going to have a real deep dive today into an interesting topic from a really cool new job title that I nef- haven't necessarily heard about a lot. So you're going to tell us what a chief architect does. I mean, I guess I know of a chief architect from the architecture world, but not necessarily from the tech world. And we're gonna go super deep into observability, what that means, how it differs from monitoring, and a bunch of other stuff that you're working on at SignalFX. But first, how'd you get into technology? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I think my earliest uh, memories of working with computers were back in seventh grade. I think my school actually had a programming class and I. I took the class. I actually didn't understand anything at the time. Uh, but uh, I think a couple of months ago, I know something happened. Things started to click into place. My dad bought me a little computer. And here I'd probably date myself because that computer now sits in the Computer History Museum. <laughs> uh, but I taught myself programming on that. I had a couple of great friends in school. We continue to be good friends to this day, actually. And we were kind of like in that same programming environment together. We taught each, uh, taught each other. We kind of like grew up together. And that kind of like became a, a passion of mine. I think uh, get heading into eighth grade, ninth grade. I think at that time, I already knew that I really loved working with computers. And so it's been sort of a, a continuous journey since then. And where was that? Where did you grow up? I grew up in India. This is in Bangalore, India. Today, it's the uh, Silicon Valley of India. But at the time, it was just a sleepy town. And what's interesting, too, is you got your PhD in computer science, which is not always the case for, I feel, I feel like, especially here in the Valley, you have a lot of people who skip undergrad altogether. Why did you do that? So at the time when I, uh, so I, I left India right after high school and I came here for my undergraduate study. I did it in a liberal arts college called Ohio Wesleyan University. And I really loved the environment there. So they had kind of like a combined department of mathematics and computer science. And I really, I really loved studying the subjects there. And I kind of had like this close relationship with academia. I really enjoyed the studying, the learning, and the environment of university. But in the back of my mind, I always knew that I didn't want to become a professor myself, but I really enjoyed the whole process. And so after my bachelor's degree, you know, I did my master's, and then it was almost a natural continuation into my PhD. I think uh, you were mentioning that a lot of people kind of like skip that process. And I think a lot of that happened with some many of my classmates in graduate school as well. They were you know, the, the dot-com thing was like heating up a lot at that time. And here I'm probably dating myself, but a lot of them kind of like left early or quit their PhDs early and went on to graduates, uh, like went on directly to industry. But to me, I felt that if I didn't take that opportunity and, and finish my PhD, I would probably not come back if I didn't do it right then. So uh, it was there. And in the back of your mind, you're always thinking, you know, am I, is this really something that I'm going to be using, uh, whatever I do over here? Sometimes you get your PhD in a very specific topic and you're wondering whether you're ever going to use that again. But I always had a sense that no knowledge was wasted. And I think in this large scheme of things, I, 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 I do use sort of a lot of the skills that I learned uh, during that entire process in my day-to-day work as well. Let's get into what you're working on at SignalFX. And for those of our listeners who who also listen to Marketing Trends, one of our other podcasts here at here at Mission, we had a SignalFX guest on that podcast, Tom, who's actually in studio right now with us. Surprise. So if, yeah, surprise, <laughs> right? So if if Tom, if you hear another a third voice, you know, piping into your uh your AirPods or whatever you're listening on, 
That's the voice of Tom, the CMO for SignalFX. This is a great opportunity for me to get to know Rajesh better, to tell his story <laughs> like, uh, like he hasn't necessarily told it to date. Yeah, no, th- I mean, this is really fun. And, and this is actually a teaser because we're going to have someone else from SignalFX on an upcoming episode, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll hold that. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll tease it at the very end. But tell me what you do as a chief architect and what types of things, what's the scope of responsibilities and what types of things are you working at at SignalFX? Sure. So the chief architect is sort of an interesting role uh, in a company. I guess many companies might fold some of those functions into a CTO-like function, but we are sort of a little bit more deliberate in the way that we approach it at SignalFX. The way I describe it is that the chief architect is a little bit more on a strategic uh, looking at the technology roadmap, trying to look at what we should be working on six months from now or 12 months from now, uh, but kind of like focusing on the actual implementation and the architecture of the system itself. So a complex system like SignalFX, there's a lot of development happening on it all the time. Uh, You want to be very conscious that you're making the right kind of technical choices on the things that you make. And while different groups are are working, there might be some common themes or you might notice that there's a relationship between what they're doing and you want to kind of like bring all those strands together to make a coherent picture of the entire architecture. So you, you don't want to be accumulating too much technical debt. You want to make sure that development is happening in the right direction, that you're making uh, strategic choices in the choice of technologies and things like that. And I think uh, the, the chief architect, we basically prioritize some of this work uh, on a longer term thing. We call it sort of the non-functional backlog. So usually product management owns the features and the user visible part of things. But there's a lot of development that you do in terms of care and feeding of your existing system, paying down technical debt, making changes to scalability and stability and all. So all that development also has to be prioritized and you make sure that you're continuing working on those as well, not just feature development. So we collaborate with like the product management function to make sure that all that work is also getting done in a timely way. So that's kind of like my, that's one of our functions. The other things that we do uh, looking on just basically like managing uh, technology and the way technology is understood and used within the organization. So as new engineers come on board, for example, I consider it like part of our job to make sure that they understand what we are building. We get them onboarded, we get them productive. And so education and onboarding is kind of also something that I consider part of our function. So that's kind of like a rough sense of what the, the chief architect does, especially at Signal Effects. Yeah, it's pretty interesting because I think a lot of, depending on the company, that might, all of that stuff might fall under the CIO, might fall under the CTO. It might be split amongst those. How do you work within the construct of what happens internally versus, it seems like a lot of that is internal versus like customer facing. Are you talking to customers? Is that more of a CTO responsibility? How does that how do you kind of amalgamate all that stuff together? Yeah, so I, I do occasionally talk to customers, but I think the way things lie at single effects, uh, the CTO handles a lot of the external facing, like representing technology to our customers and that kind of thing. And I'm more of the internal facing function, uh, which is about managing how technology gets built and deployed and stuff like that. But that being said, like, you know, Arjit, who's the CTO and I are like very close colleagues. You know, we were colleagues at Facebook and we continue to be good friends and and we work together on almost everything. So when representing the architecture or trying to figure out like what the current picture is, like we are always in close contact with each other. But I do do some external facing stuff and Arjit is also definitely engaged on the internal facing things as well. But primarily our focus is our, you know, he is more on the external and me on the internal side. Yeah, I, I know it's a unique job title, but I must tell you that the very core of what Signal Effects is all about is in fact the architecture yeah. of the platform. And so to have somebody whose sole focus is on that architecture continues to, you know, enable us to stay ahead. Uh, because what we've created is, well, it's, there's, the, you can, probably here now there's a bunch of patents that have been awarded and it's it's really innovative yeah and i think that it, it's it's a really interesting way of slicing it because i know that you know we talked to a company here in the valley carta and their cto says his his theory was i guess they're like operational management is that cto is product side of the house and cio is internal business functions side of the house like pretty much completely separate kind of entities where one person is building product and one person is focused on essentially like employee engagement of technology, which this is interesting because you have so much external facing 
with CTO. What a great interview that would be. Maybe in uh, our part two, we're going to have uh, the CTO on and be able to mirror these two episodes up. But I think it's it's interesting that more companies don't align this way. Why do you think that that might be? I mean, you know, you've been at, at Facebook and at Google and we'll get into those experiences, but what, why do you think that this allows for a more streamlined kind of operational and like productivity standpoint way to do business? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, some of it just has to do with like personality of people and kind of like where they are. Like you can take, for example, if you're making a movie and you have a producer, there are producers who are much more engaged with the way things, you know, get get done from a directorial standpoint, for example, they might be engaged more on that, whereas others might kind of like sit back a little bit. So a lot of it has to do with like personality. I think that's part of it. But the other thing is like, as, as you mentioned, there's a uh, there are things that we do when we represent the product externally that we are, because we are an engineering sort of very technology heavy focus, that we like to have people who come from the engineering strain to represent that technology to our customers. Whereas in, in many other companies, it might be something that, you know, the, the marketing team or the sales team does more of. And so that that kind of like coverage pivots the whole the whole spectrum of responsibilities inside inside Signal FX. So so because Arjit like comes with that engineering background and he he still takes that on as part of his portfolio to represent it externally, then it leaves like there's this other big function that we have to take care of. Uh, and so that kind of falls under the chief architecture and the chief of the chief architect sort of that side of things in general i think so as you mentioned that in some companies it's like the cto versus cio and in our company it's basically the cto versus versus the chief architect so um and there are sort of like the the cio is usually often also responsible for business systems yeah. that are inside the company but for the chief architect like that's not the case uh, in in signal effects I take care of most like the technology for the product itself, but like business systems like email and like Salesforce and all that kind of stuff are not things that that I handle directly. Let's talk about observability and specifically what you're working on with Signal FX as an operational intelligence platform. Can you share more about what the company does and and what are the specific things that you're working on and building? You know, the way we we describe Signal FX to anyone who's kind of like new to us. Is that we say that we are a, we're a cloud cloud environment observability platform, uh, and that has like a few different components to it. So the first thing is like you know cloud environments. So now everyone is kind of like familiar with what the cloud and what it is. But if you go back like several years, it was somewhat somewhat of a relatively new concept. Companies like Facebook and Google had what we now call private clouds, but at the time they were just like massive data centers of very very large numbers of machines. And you had to kind of like build up the expertise to be able to deploy applications at scale, to understand them, to operate them, to monitor them. And a lot of stuff that we did at SignalFX was was kind of like taking those experiences and that knowledge you know, into what we were doing. But now in the, in the age of like public clouds, it's not a problem that only the Googles and the Facebooks of the world face, but like any large application, any large system, any large kind of successful company, that has a digital strategy is kind of like facing those same problems or echoes of those same problems at some scale or the other. And so a lot of the lessons that we learned are like broadly applicable to them. So what we've built is an observability platform for people to understand how those applications behave. Are they working as they are intended? Is there any problem? Or uh, if there isn't a problem, like can you still understand what's happening inside the application? Because you would need that level of understanding to fix any problems that might arise in the future. So like monitoring of of these applications is sort of by itself not a new concept. Like people have been monitoring systems for as long as systems have been built. I think what's changed is that, you know, cloud environments make these systems much more complicated. They are much larger in scale. They are much wider in scope. And and the lifetimes of individual components have been shrinking like anything. It used to be that you could stand up a machine and you'd run it for a few months. Uh, Now it's common to stand up a container that runs for a few minutes or you can like fire up a Lambda or a function that might run for just a few seconds. Monitoring that kind of activity with very high flux is like a complicated problem. And so what we've built is a platform that gives you real-time insight into how these entire environments work. And that insight you apply to making sure that your environments work as intended, but also help understand and give you insight into their operation in general. And so observability is sort of that second part of the problem, which is not only do you know that this thing is working, but you have some insight into what's happening internally uh, 
so that if something breaks or is not quite working the way you expect, you actually have some insight into what's actually happening inside. Yeah, I was going to say that it's not only um, understanding what's happening, but actually now uh, being directly led to where it may be happening. Yeah. Uh, so that you can actually correct it in the time that it takes you know you to do so, which these days isn't isn't much because customers expect <laughs> instantaneous. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the you know types of companies that you all work with and like who are the people on the team? Who is this affecting? What are the people's kind of like journey to cloud native or maybe they're somewhere on that journey, but they don't necessarily know how to get from A to B. What, what are those type of those customers that you are working with and talking to? What are the issues that they're having? Sure. So if you look at our uh, kind of like our customer base at, uh, at large, you know, the, the kinds of companies that we work with actually span the entire length and breadth of the industry. It used to be like, oh, you know, maybe this only affects the very, very large companies who are very sophisticated, who are like web native or so on and so forth. Do you mean like Fortune 500 or do you mean? I mean, like companies that you are, you, you would consider them to be native to the web. So maybe they started out like, you know, like Square or Stripe or, you know, the companies like that. But in fact, you know, the kinds of companies that we're having traction with like spans the entire industry. So payment tech is, of course, one of them. But like everyone from apparel manufacturers to like people who are doing payment processing, people who are doing various kinds of reviews of food, uh, like Yelp, for example. And so it's not so much the company itself or which vertical or which industry they are in, but rather their maturity in kind of their organization in this whole digital transformation. So every company now needs sort of a digital transformation that's kind of becoming a, a given. Uh, if you don't have some sort of an online presence or if you don't have a way of like using a, uh, using an internet strategy or companies probably doomed in the long run. And so this is a transformation that's happening across the entire like width and breadth of the industry. Now it might be that in some companies you have uh, one small division that's trying to drive a digital business forward, whereas in other companies it might be an initiative that spans the entire organization. But uh, regardless of the scale of which we're, uh, of this transformation is in the, inside the company, it's basically something that continues to grow inside every organization. And so we are finding traction across from very small to very large companies. But if you look at the personas who use SignalFX and the, who who use the product and who are trying to deploy the product. You know, there's this whole DevOps culture yeah. where you have people who are doing operations and you have the developers and there used to be two different sort of personas. But now that's kind of like merging where developers are getting very, very close to operations and are in fact most of the time responsible for their own operations. So these developers are sort of like they ask more sophisticated questions from their applications. They want to understand something at more fundamental levels than people who are just pure operators. And that's where an observability platform like SignalFX really like comes into play because these engineers say, okay, I'm writing some code, I'm deploying it, but I really need to understand how well is it working because that's going to inform, for example, what I do next week or next month, in addition to monitoring if something happens. So that category of user is a very sort of very key persona in the whole SignalFX ecosystem. The other one is like in larger organizations, you usually have some group that's trying to deploy monitoring as a common strategy or observability as a strategy across the entire organization. And in those organizations, you have a, the observability group is what we offer as service bureaus. So they are basically almost deploying signal effects as a service to everybody or for other engineers in the organization. Oh, got it. Okay. And so we offer a bunch of tools for them to manage usage and kind of like hand out how the uh, understand how the system is being used across the entire user community and so on and so forth. So they are also uh, sort of a key persona in the SignalFX ecosystem because they they represent our company to their internal customers, so to speak. And uh, they need a bunch of tools and, and, and they are sort of our, our champions as well within those organizations. So if you look across the entire company, you're asking the, the kinds of users that we that we have. It's like the DevOps, the engineers and the operations guys, the service bureau type people, who are running the observability teams. And then it's across organizations that are kind of either starting in their early, early in their journey or fairly along their digital uh, transformation journey. Okay, so what do you think the difference is between observability and monitoring? Or is it the same thing? I mean, is this just, is it lexicon or is this actually something that has some type of uh, important business difference? 
So monitoring is a, is a function that has, you know, has been around as long as people have run systems. When you're operating a service, you always want to know the very first question you have is like, is it up or is it down? Yeah. And, and monitoring is basically trying to answer that question. Uh, is to tell you whether the service is up or down. But that's only the first step because in this in this day and age of deploying applications very quickly and doing very rapid pushes and of having very largely dispersed and very uh, deeply engaged users, when something goes wrong, you also need to know what has gone wrong so that you can very quickly fix it and deploy it. So it's no longer acceptable to have like a one hour or two hour downtime when something happens. Even a few minutes is, is way too much. And that's kind of where observability comes in, which is it's not just sufficient to know whether something's up or down, but you need to know why has it gone down? What aspect of it is not working? What do you need to do to fix that problem? The practice of observability gives you insight into all the internal state of those systems. So as, as you see a transaction flowing through and you might notice that, okay, this aspect of this transaction is where it's broken and you need to address that. And even in regular operation, even if things aren't, aren't broken and you see the state of how resources are being used or how transactions are flowing through your system, the, the ability of looking inside your system and understanding how all these different components are working gives you insight into how these applications work. And that's actually great to build up that picture in your mind of what a healthy application looks like. And it also gives you insight into, okay, here are some components that might need work or here are some components that might become a bottleneck and that would kind of inform your development going forward where you could focus on improving those components. So it's not just something that you look at only when things are broken. Like when you use observability as a practice in your organization, you kind of look at your applications like almost all the time or rather than just when things are broken, which is sort of a more monitoring sort of a way of looking at things. It's the difference between that real-time problem detection, which is super important to the predictability part of it is how can we like lean ahead and try to figure out what is going to happen and prevent it from going down in the first place. Yeah, so it's at Signal Effects, for example, you know, the one real fun thing about working at Signal Effects is that we are one of our biggest users. Uh, we monitor Signal Effects using Signal Effects. And not only do, do we just use it for monitoring, but we use it as an observability platform. So any features that we build, for example, we instrument it. Yeah. Uh, and so when we launch it, we see, okay, how well is it being used? How well is it working relative to the previous implementation? Like, And so by looking at these metrics on an ongoing basis, we say, okay, is this feature that we need to turn on? And once we turn it on, how well is it working? And if it's not working so well, then maybe we should figure out where the problem is. And so we add more instrumentation to figure out where the problem is. And so that, that kind of like, ongoing engagement with your product rather than just, okay, is it broken or is it not, is sort of a critical thing because it really helps pace out your development, really rounds out how your, your understanding of the, of the whole system. So who manages those dashboards? Do those come to you? <laughs> it's sort of a cross-functional thing, but it does require a little bit of curation on part of the whole engineering team to kind of monitor the main top level metrics and then to drill down when issues are happening to look look into the the subsystems that that might need uh, kind of like some help. Yeah. So what does this look like in five years? Like where is this going? What is, you know, as people continue these business transformations and, and their kind of cloud native journey, you know, where does where do we get to? So I think there are a few interesting trends that are happening. If you just look at the workloads themselves that have to be monitored, the services that you have to monitor are becoming much more numerous uh, in number, like I would say you know, it used to be that you would just use a load balancer in a database, but now if you look at the number of things that Amazon and Google offers, for example, the number of services that you might use, that's growing very large. The, the lifetime of components continues to shrink. Uh, like I said, from hosts to containers to functions, these things are growing down to number of seconds. And it's also becoming sort of a very diverse, heterogeneous world where it's now normal for most organizations to be multi-cloud. So they might have something in Amazon and Google and they yeah. might have a private cloud and so on and so forth. So uh, the, the universe of monitorables and observables is kind of like growing very large. If you look at observability as a whole, it used to be a lot of the emphasis was on collecting data, but collecting data has become sort of a commoditized problem. It's not interesting anymore. Uh, and right now where the whole industry is focused on is managing data and giving you insight from that data on dashboarding, anomaly detection, things like that. I think the future of this whole space is going to be around proactively telling you, even before you've defined an anomaly detector yourself, of where a problem might be occurring to help you 
sort of do a root cause analysis, help you triage and find out where the issue is. Because if you look at modern systems, they are very large uh, meshes of like services. They are these very large microservice-based architecture, sometimes dozens, sometimes even hundreds or thousands of microservices. So a single transaction might hit many, many thousands of hosts. And trying to localize and find out where the problem is, is very difficult. And well, yeah, what would, say, I mean, and because you've been, you've been working on the microservices APM, I, I'm, I'm curious, like, what would those type of microservices be that would, you know, those, those thousand, what would a few of those be? And why would that be something that you would need to pinpoint it at, at, you know, and, and find the root cause of those different things? Sure. So uh, I think a great example of uh, visualizing or trying to understand microservices, uh, imagine that you hit the front page of amazon.com. So if you look at the the front page of amazon.com uh, and if you are let's say if you're a prime member you might have some promotions for prime members that would be something that uh, let's say a prime membership service would be responsible for supplying that content to the home page uh, you might also have some products that you've previously purchased and there might be some personalized recommendations based on your specific preferences that would be another service that was supplying that content to you uh, you might have an icon that says, okay, you have like 20 items in your shopping cart and there's another service that's responsible for doing that. And they might have seasonal kind of like promotions. So if you if just hitting the, the, that front page of Amazon might actually be hitting like a dozen or so microservices that are each responsible for providing some amount of content that's finally assembled into your homepage. Now the shopping cart service itself, for example, might have to look at your account. Uh, it might have to look into a database, it might have to look into a whole bunch of other things to itself give you some information about what's in your shopping cart. Or uh, if you're looking at the one that tells you about your personal re personalized recommendations, yeah. it might have to look into, you know, what kinds of movies have you previously watched or what kinds of items have you previously purchased. So if you look at, uh, you're hitting a dozen microservices, those services themselves are turning around and talking to other services. And the idea is you take a very large complicated problem like the Amazon homepage, and you break it up into small components that you can distribute to different teams that can build those services independently and deploy them independently. So you don't all have, have to like walk in, do all your development in lockstep. The advantage of that is it gives your organization a lot of flexibility, both technically and organizationally to move quickly and to develop quickly. The downside of having that really complicated architecture is that it's very hard to pinpoint when there is a problem because you're now talking to like dozens and sometimes like these services start becoming very small. They, there's a service only responsible for generating unique IDs, for example, yeah. or for indexing videos, or you have another service that's responsible for doing inventory tracking or payment processing. And so you very quickly end up with like hundreds or, or thousands of microservices as, as it might be for Amazon. And now if you do a single transaction and the transaction here might be, I'm viewing the homepage, well, it, it's going to end up like talking to hundreds or thousands of these microservices and that are all providing content that needs to be assembled and then shown on the page. Now imagine that this homepage uh, loads slowly for 0.5 of the customers. Uh, it takes three seconds or five seconds for it to load, whereas for everybody else, it loads super fast. Like how would you identify where the problem is? And that's kind of like the issue that we face with a lot of these uh, microservices APM type use cases where you're trying to identify like these transaction flows and where it might be slowing down and for whom. So the way SignalFX kind of attacks this problem is that we use a scheme that's similar to many others, which is you, you try and like follow this flow of this transaction as it goes through the entire system. The challenge here is that the number of transactions can be extremely large for a site like Amazon, but even like for a more modest sites, it can be in the billions of transactions a day, right? So this would be like a billion page views, for example. And so because the number of traces can be so large, you usually do some sort of a sampling scheme, which is, hey, I'm not going to try, I'm not going to capture 100% of it, I'll capture, let's say, 1% of it. And if my sample is good enough, I should get enough insight into what's happening. In most of our competitors' offerings, this choice of whether you're going to capture this trace or not is made at the very beginning. You say, okay, somebody's going to hit this page, am I going to capture this trace or not? And one time out of 100, on average, you'll say yes, and the other 99 times, you'll say no. This approach is called head-based sampling, where you kind of get a uniform random sample across the entire population. Uh, the advantage of head-based sampling is that uh, it's easy to implement. All the math that you do on it is statistically valid because it's a random sample. But the disadvantage of this is that it might not actually capture the behavior that you're trying to examine. It might not capture those 0.5% of 
bad traces that are that are taking a really long time. So at SignalFX, we have a different strategy where we examine every single trace in the system, but we obviously can't store all that information because there's way too many of them. So instead, what we do is as we are observing every trace, we build up a data model of what a normal trace looks like and how it normally behaves. And if a trace comes in that's kind of like anomalous res with respect to that data model, then we say, okay, ah, this trace is interesting and I'm going to retain it. And the way we make those uh, observations is that we look at every span and say, how long does the span usually take? This particular operation, how long does it usually take? And if it takes longer, if it has taken longer than what it usually does, then we say, okay, there's something wrong with this trace, I'm going to retain it. And so this is sort of the approach that we take. So this is called a, a tail-based selection, or we call it no sampling, because you're not actually doing a random sample. And what this lets us do is it captures a lot of these anomalous traces, and it, you help identify these problems much much easier because you've actually captured all those anomalous traces as opposed to saying if it was just random chance whether you happen to capture them or not. It's also very complicated to implement. There's a bunch of data science that we had to do in there to kind of represent what a normal trace looks like. And, and how do we do that efficiently? So that was kind of the challenge, but we I think we did a pretty good job on that. And so that's one of our primary differentiators. Also, there's a great ebook that you all have done that um, we'll link up in the show notes that, that kind of looks at, at some of this sort of stuff for those who want to go deeper on all this and Kubernetes and stuff sure. as well. Yep. Going back to real-time cloud monitoring, how is this evolving? What are you seeing as the evolution of the way that this is done and the way that this can be done moving forward? Yeah, so actually, uh, as of now, we are the only real-time monitoring system. All the other systems sort of do it with some amount of latency, which is on the order of a few minutes in the common case. When we built SignalFX, we had the sense that real-time insight is a very important component of monitoring these large, complicated applications. You know, I'm a bit of an aviation geek, uh, <laughs> and, and my EVP of engineering, Leonid, is also an aviation geek. So we're often fond of making sort of, you know, aviation analogies when we talk about when we talk about signal effects and real time monitoring. But we look at our dashboards as kind of like the instruments that you use to operate to fly an airplane. And it's it's not much use to those instruments. Like if you make a change, you, you you try and move the stick to the left or right, and it takes you a minute or two to find out what your new heading is. Like it would be an extremely difficult yeah to to try and fly an airplane like that. And that's kind of like why real time systems are critical. Which is when you make a change to a system, you would like to see immediately how that system is reacting. That's one aspect of it. The second aspect and sort of like more critical thing that people can immediately relate to is that. When we can detect a problem within two seconds of it happening, it gives your organization a lot of flexibility to handle that situation rather than waiting and finding out that it, you know, if you find out like five or 10 minutes after it happened, uh, by that time your, your users have probably already seen it, they're probably yeah. already tweeting about it. And uh, in this age of like three nines and four nines and that kind of availability, every second matters. And so, having a real-time system that can let you know as soon as possible is sort of a very critical capability that's becoming sort of almost, I would say, a requirement, and especially in some of these very highly ephemeral environments. If you have a container, for example, that, that spins up and runs for a few minutes and shuts down, like knowing what it did like five minutes after the fact is almost useless. Yeah. Uh, one of our customers, you know, they do flash sales of, of apparel. The entire sale lasts like four to five minutes, but in that five minutes, they sell millions of dollars worth of apparel. If it takes you two minutes to find out that there's a problem, that has a very concrete cost associated with it. So there's this real-time nature of monitoring is, is becoming sort of a critical capability in operating these large sort of environments with very, very high uptime requirements. Yeah, you know, it's. I was thinking about this the other day. I applied to stay at this campsite. This is like really hard to get campsite. And it opens, it's like, you know, Department of Agriculture or whoever, whoever runs the website. And basically 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific, like on the dot is when it opens up, right? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about just how much the government specifically will have to engineer these extreme, like we're at the very, very beginning of how complex these sites that we're going to require 
instantaneous results. We're going to require, you know, as you mentioned, all of this real time monitoring. And if our, you know, government agencies, I think someone, uh, someone was talking about the other day about how, uh, getting the IRS the ability to do online online tax returns, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's being lobbied against and all this sort of <laughs> yeah. stuff, but not to go into that part of it. But but this idea that there are so many people that could potentially, so many companies or the government or whoever it is that could be left behind by the fact that if you're not to a second, like how can you, how can you, you know, let something uh, online that happens exactly at that moment in time? You see, you know, things like flash sales, that was a great example, people selling concert tickets, all of these things where there's so, you can get so creative, especially from like, you know, marketing and sales, sales standpoint, getting people in the right place at the right time. And if, you know, everyone was worried, oh, another example, when Game of Thrones launched, everyone was like, of course, Game of Thrones, HBO Now and HBO Go, they're definitely yeah. going to crash, right? Because yeah. yeah. everybody in the world is going to be watching that, everybody in the world. But tens of millions of people are going to be watching this thing. I think it's just such a relevant thing that I think CIOs and CTOs are worried about is how do you stay at the cutting edge? How do you stay in real time when that is the expectation all the time to be down to the second that it's always working? And you know, to your point with the aviation thing, we would have never allowed for that, you know, in, in aviation. But now with, you know, being off by a minute, you could be missing out on millions of dollars, tens of million dollars or, or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Or just trust. I mean, or just customer trust or, or anything like that. And you spend all this time to get them to your site and now they're not going to buy because, you know, your shopping cart has been down for five minutes. Absolutely. And, you know, you'd, you'd asked like a couple of seconds ago about like the future of this whole observability space. So I think two critical things that I think are going to happen. So one is that like we are receiving a lot of data. So we receive like, for example, some of our bigger customers, they send us like tens of almost hundreds of millions of data points that we receive almost on every, every minute. And there's going to be quite, kind of like increasing amount of data science that we need to do on this almost in real time to be able to extract and like identify like leading indicators of, of instability and so on and so forth. So I think that's going to be an exciting field where there's going to be a lot more data science being applied on all this data. And the second interesting thing is this, this and this is where it ties into the real-time system, is, is that there's going to be a lot more automation that hangs off of this. And this is a new field that's kind of being spoken about called AI ops, which is to bring like data science and automation so that many of these sites are almost like self-operated using you know, real-time analytics, and then using automation so that we can remediate things automatically as as issues arise and you know that's only going to be successful if you have a real time system because otherwise you're just not going to be able to react in time or make the right kinds of observations or control any system with any amount of fidelity unless you have a real time system all right let's switch gears here to some of your time early days at google early days at facebook you started at google in 2002 you started at facebook in 2009 so some really interesting times, early days for those companies. And I think that we've had some folks on the show that have talked about that sort of thing, but or about being at those companies specifically in those time frames. And I would love to ask you, what was it like being a software engineer at those companies when being a software engineer was the creme de la creme you know what i mean it was like it was the job to be in the valley was uh was in those companies being in that kind of title well i mean undoubtedly it was an amazing experience you know being at google at the time that i was in 2002 and you know this was still the aftershocks of the whole dot-com explosion and so a sentiment in the valley as a whole was a little bit down in in, in energy but when you got to Google, like things were just like buzzing. This was really like when the company was really taking off. What year was this? So this was 2002. Or sorry, how, how big was the company? So the company was, I, th I think I was, a, I was employee number 400-ish. Oh, something wow. Something like that, which I thought was very large <laughs> at the yeah. time because I'd worked at a tiny startup prior to that. But who knew it would become what it became? Uh, at the time, I, I joined a, a group called the Production Group. And looking back, this is kind of like, I would say, uh, a lot of the the modern concepts around the DevOps culture were actually already like kind of like taking root at Google. The production team was uh, responsible for basically all the stuff of actually operating these, uh, operating the entire Google system in production. And so it included a bunch of us that were building tools for cluster management. And it also required, uh, it also included people who actually carried pagers 
and they became what what became the site reliability engineering team at the time the the whole site reliability engineering concept wasn't yet there <laughs> Uh, you had operations guys who carried pagers, and then you had like software engineers. But the the production team was sort of like the first, in my experience, like was the first time that we actually saw some of this DevOps culture taking root. Wow! Uh, because we also had like engineers who were responsible for the systems that you ran. Those kinds of like values that we had at Google was new to me at the time, and I think it was still relatively new in the in the industry as a whole. It was a really exciting time for sure. I was, you know, we were routinely working with clusters of, you know, tens of thousands of servers, which now is like it's a laughable amount for Google. But, but even at that time, I thought like these were among the largest clusters anywhere in the world, and the number of machines was just exploding. You know, day by day, week by week, we were turning up new data centers. It was just an immense amount of activity, and it was a sort of a very fun time. We had a, in some ways, a relaxed and very positive attitude to work. It was a very enjoyable time at Google for sure. Well, you were already a PhD of computer science at this point, right? Yes, I was. So, I mean, I, I and the reason why I want to kind of harp on this a little bit is you kind of get a lot of people that kind of give the opposite advice these days. But do you feel like you were really ready for this type of opportunity because you'd spent essentially a decade in school, you know, nine years in school, <laughs> like ready to ready to do this thing? Yeah, actually, that's a great question. You know, at the time that Google was interviewing, they really valued PhDs. Uh, that changed a few years later, but at the time they really gave a lot of value to people who had PhDs. There was a lot of interesting sort of like data science and large system work already being done at Google, and so I guess that's the reason that they wanted that kind of profile. But like you know, for me joining Google was not like a huge stretch. So even though I was in academia, I actually worked at the University of Wisconsin where I got my PhD. I got my PhD. Basically, building interesting functionality into a system that has kind of like been a production quality system for a long time, and it continues to be actually like decades later. And so, I kind of had my hands dirty building real systems for a while. So, to that extent, it wasn't a huge like culture shock or something like that to me. There were other culture shocks for me at Google. <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, it was very strange for me to to rub shoulders with people like Rob Pike. And Ken Thompson and Alex Martelli and Guido Van Rossum and like these were like you know guys that you read about in books who had written books or who had like done like significant things, and it, it was strange to be like office mates with them, and it it always gave me a little bit you know you felt a little bit of that imposter syndrome. Yeah, of course. <laughs> at at a place like Google, it was like almost a crushing thing. Like you had to learn how to deal with that stuff because you know it, it, you have to believe that you belong, and you have to. You have to kind of like get along with the business of doing things. Otherwise, it, otherwise it would just like crush you. I suppose. When you were there through the IPO, and then a, a good while after that, there's a um, and I, you you might be able to tell the story better, but that uh, I forget who it was. I think it was maybe Larry or I don't know, either Larry or Sergey that didn't go to the IPO. That like stayed with the engineers or something like that. It's so like oh whatever, it's not that big a deal. Yeah, they were both largely sort of like irreverent <laughs> people. A lot of the stuff about you know, Sergey famously always wore athletic shoes. He always wore tennis sneakers, even if he wore a suit or whatever. There are little quips about you know things like that, which were really funny. I can I can tell you a pretty funny story. Even Eric Schmidt was pretty laid back. So we had uh, at the time Google's uh, entire office in Mountain View was like one building in twenty four hundred Bayshore. Yeah, and um, like space for engineers to even sit down and do their work was like absolute premium. Because you know, week by week we would be hiring ten, twenty people, and it was in this one building, and we couldn't find space for any of yeah. these engineers. One particular engineer who's been around for a while, Amit Patel, he noticed that Eric Schmidt is always traveling, and his office was always empty. He just moved his desk into Eric Schmidt's oh. office. Oh my god! <laughs> so Eric Schmidt, so Eric came back from this trip, and he saw this engineer sitting inside his office, and you know, to his credit, he was very cool about it. He's like, oh, yeah, sure, I'm fine with it." <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. That's all the crazy things that happened back then, yeah. That's great. Did you find that that culture, you know, has helped you, you know, be a chief architect? You know, you've you've been with a company, SignalFX for for a number of years now and been building and you all are growing really fast. Did you get something where there's some type of leadership lessons or or anything that you kind of gleaned from that experience or or even we can get into the Facebook stuff as well? Yeah, I think there were definitely things that I that I learned at Google that I really appreciate. So, 
I mentioned that you rubbed shoulders with all these like famous personalities, but the one thing that really struck struck me was that none of them really threw their weight around. They never threw their name around. You know, you could go up to them and ask them questions that, you know, in retrospect, you might think is a dumb question or whatever, but they never made you feel that you were bothering them or asking a stupid question. That, and then there was always a culture of, of arguing ideas on their own merit and not bringing like personality or like, you know, there was no sort of a personal dimension to any of those discussions, which I think I, I really valued. And uh, I've been very kind of keen on making sure that we continue that culture. I think Facebook was very similar in that, in that sense that there were a lot of ex-Googlers at Facebook too, from other great companies as well. But there were a lot of similarities in culture in that way. People were very focused on their work, on getting things done, and not so much on egos or you know, throwing titles around. Uh, titles were never a big thing, either at Google or Facebook. That's something that we're also pretty keen on at, at SignalFX. Yeah, I mean, Tom, when we talked on, on marketing trends, he, it's one of the reasons why he was so excited to join was just the founding team is, and, and all the leadership team are so proficient and brilliant, but also I think just the way the general culture and everything was really cool to hear. Yeah, I'm very proud of our team actually. But engineering culture is one of those things. It's it's like an intangible. Yeah, <laughs> but it's it's important to maintain the the culture and the ethos of an organization. It's part of the identity of the team, uh, the identity of the organization, and you know you have to do some active amount of work to to maintain that. Otherwise, you lose your sense of what made Signal Effects Signal Effects or what made Google Google. You have a really funny uh, Facebook story. I, I want you to to I don't know if you can share it for the audience, but it would be I think it's it's pretty great. Sure. Uh, so I was about six or seven weeks uh, having left Google and having joined Facebook. So at Facebook, they have this great process of onboarding, which they call boot camp. And this is 2009. So this, this is, is 2009. Like early days. Yeah, fairly early days at, at Facebook. How so many have, employees do you think? Maybe 1500 ish, something like that. Which again, to the time at the time, I thought was fairly large. But yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, so bootcamp usually lasts around six weeks. As an engineer, it's a really interesting process because you, you go and you actually solve actual engineering problems for various teams. They, they put tasks, usually self-contained, not very large tasks, but actual tasks that, that are actual engineering work. Instead of writing Mickey Mouse programs, you actually go and add a little feature or fix a little bug or something like that. And in doing that, you kind of learn the whole system and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I was going working my way through boot camp and I thought I had a fairly successful boot camp. I had finished about six weeks of it. And then I received this email and it came directly from Mark Zuckerberg. Like I'm kidding you not, like the from is Mark Zuckerberg and the title of the email is You Are Fired. <laughs> oh my God. So at this point, I'm like, oh my God, what the hell did I do? And then uh, I, I opened the email and I looked at it and it was kind of written, you know, very concretely on a one-to-one person-to-person sort of like communication style. But then like none of it was like making any sense to me. But like I, after a few times of reading it over, I found out that Facebook was of course working on new products and new projects. And, and somebody had leaked this information about one of those projects to the press. And Mark was obviously very upset about it. He was addressing himself to that particular person, but had sent the email to the company at large because they had not yet identified that single person. And they were you know, having the security team chase that down. But in, in the meantime, he was making his displeasure known to the organization at large. But just the way that it came in, yeah. that it was like addressed to a single person, uh, it was an interesting few moments till I understood what was happening. It's, it's such a... Uh cold bucket of water on your shoulders when you see that. And I'm sure your heart sinks and you're like, well, I haven't done anything. Yeah, absolutely. I thought I was doing a pretty good job until then. <laughs> Let's get into the lightning round. These questions are fast and easy, just like the lightning platform from Salesforce. You can go to salesforce.com slash build mobile apps to learn more about how you can be fast and easy. Like this round of questions. Are you ready? Sure. Number one. What app on your phone are you using that is the most fun? I would say Slack. Oh, all right. All right. What do you do for fun on a day-to-day basis so on the weekends here in the Bay Area? So I'm learning to play the guitar. I would say that's the most fun thing that I do. Do you fly? I do not fly yet. Working on it? But I do read a lot about airplanes. What is your best advice 
for a first time chief architect? For first time chief architect. Wow, that's a great question. I'd say that your job is to make sure that the right decisions get made, but not necessarily that you have to personally make each and every one of those decisions. You have to make the environment so that people make the right decisions. You have to encourage people to kind of collaborate and make the right decisions rather than forcing your decision on everyone. Do you have a favorite recent book or podcast that you've read or listened to? Uh, so books wise, my favorite has to be Patrick O'Brien's Aubrey Maturin series of books. It's actually oh, yeah. a series of like 21 books. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. Podcast. I like Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic stuff. Do you have a favorite team, sports or otherwise? Depends on the sport. But yeah, football, I like Green Bay Packers. Oh, all right. Formula One, I like Mercedes. Final question of the lightning round. What is the worst advice that you've gotten in your career? <sighs> I haven't gotten a lot of career advice, to be honest. And as a result, I've made lots of mistakes <laughs> <laughs> purely on my own merit. But I'd say, so let me just say, so the mistakes that I made, is that working with people, networking with people, and understanding what they are doing and making them understand what you're doing is at some level even more important than just writing code. And that's something that like, especially engineers don't fully understand, especially when you're fresh out of school. So I would say spend a lot of time on that. I love it. That's it. That's it for the lightning round and for today's interview. Uh, well, I guess I'll say uh, people uh, you can find Rajesh on the Twitters at Real Rajesh Rahman. Yep. Actually, I, do you want a funny, funny story yeah. about Facebook about that? Sure. Yeah. So Facebook was obviously I already had this big platform. I was not on Facebook yet for a really long time. And there was this time where Facebook said, okay, now everybody gets like a, like a handle. You can go grab your handle. And of course I didn't pay any attention to it. Yeah. And then at the time that I, that I interviewed at Facebook, they said, well, you must have a handle because otherwise, you know, that's the way it works. So I, I searched for Rajesh Raman, Rajesh dot Raman, Raman, like every single variation of that and all of it was taken. So I just, and this is, I swear, this is way before Donald Trump, okay? I had I'd not never known who the hell Donald Trump was at the time. So I just chose the real Rajesh Raman. I show up to my first day at work at Facebook and they do all your IT provisioning and they give you a laptop and all that yeah. kind of stuff. And my internal corporate email address was the real Rajesh Raman oh at Facebook.com. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, that's not going to cut it. And I had to go get a special exemption where I could use, you know, an, uh, an, an email address that would not make me subject to ridicule oh, from everybody so else. <laughs> and I'm sure, and I'm sure once Trump got elected, it was, pro well, I guess you were gone by then, but. I was gone by then, yeah. but unfortunately my Twitter handle is still real Rajesh Raman. Uh, and so that's, I'm sure gives you the wrong impression to many people, but it is what it is. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, follow him on on, uh, on Twitter and let us uh, let us know if there's any way that we can, uh, we can help. And yeah, thanks so much for hanging out today. Thank you. Thank you again to our friends at Salesforce. IT Visionaries is brought to you by the Lightning Platform by Salesforce. Salesforce just introduced the Lightning Platform Mobile, the low-code mobile app development platform that empowers anyone to easily build, publish, and manage AI-powered mobile apps for employees and for customers. Find out more at salesforce.com slash build mobile apps.